Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. Five million coronavirus cases worldwide and still counting. World famous epidemiologist Peter Piot, who helped discover Ebola, joins us with the latest on a vaccine and what he learned from his own brush with COVID. Then, a person, not a statistic, a sister's heartfelt poem giving a human face to the dead. Also ahead. We are not all in it together. We haven't been and we're not all in it together in the pandemic. Writer Anand Girdidas tells our Hari Srinivasan how this plague exposes inequality in America and what Congress can learn from mafia movies. Plus... I call myself the gangster gardener because to me, having knowledge is gangster. Getting our hands dirty to clean up our minds. The undeniable therapeutic that is nature and gardening. Common Poor and Company is made possible by Rosalind P. Walter, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, Candace King Weir, The Anderson Family Fund, The Cheryl and Philip Milstein Family, Charles Rosenblum, The Strauss Family Foundation, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour, working from home in London. Coronavirus cases are surging past 5 million now worldwide. Most of the new cases come from just four countries, the United States, Russia, Brazil, and India. But to be human is also to be hopeful, and the British pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca has raised hopes now by saying that it could supply 400 million doses of a vaccine from September. The company is working with Oxford University, which is one of a handful of places currently holding human trials. That September date is, of course, entirely dependent on those trial results and a vaccine being developed. For more on this, I'm joined now by one of the world's leading epidemiologists, Dr. Peter Piot. He co-discovered Ebola back in 1976, and now, more than 40 years later, the virus has finally got him. That is the coronavirus, of course. And he's joining me now from his home in London. Um, Dr. Piot, really welcome back to our program. It really struck us, you know, with a shiver when we heard that you, of all people, had got coronavirus. You're back. But tell me, tell me what happened. How do you think you got it? How did it affect you? Uh, hello, uh, Christian. Good to see you again. And actually, um, it all started the last time that we, uh, we talked uh, on the 19th of March uh, when I was in your program. And uh, that day I developed um, high fever, a splitting headache, um, muscle pain everywhere, and particularly uh, a growing uh, exhaustion. And uh, so that's two months ago, and I'm still not fully recovered. As you may hear, my voice is still a bit funny, a um, bit hoarser. And um, I ended up in the hospital where for seven days where I needed uh, oxygen support. And when that was all over, um, I thought it was over, uh, I developed a so-called organizing pneumonia. In other words, there was a, a, a hyperimmune reaction of my body against the virus. It was no longer the virus, and that was infiltrating my lungs. And uh, so I suspect there will be lots of people with uh, chronic morbidity, with sequelae. <clears throat> and, you know, it made me what, in my native language, Dutch, what we call an experienced expert. Up to now, for four decades, mm -hmm. I've been fighting viruses from Ebola to, to HIV. And now I thought, OK, a virus got me. And it was like being hit by a bus uh, where the virus gets into every single cell uh, of your body. And it shows also that um, COVID-19 is more than, you know, lots of people uh, get a bit of a flu and then 1% die. And then often they say, oh, it's only people over 70 and I'm 71 or people with underlying diseases. No, there's a lot in between and a lot of people who, um, you know, will suffer from lung affections, from uh, heart problems, uh, kidney problems uh, and so on. So that is really uh, gave me a so, new insight. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you, 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 you got there before me. I was going to say, did you learn new stuff about COVID after experiencing it and seeing the after effects on yourself? And clearly that seems to be the case. Yeah, absolutely. This is not like some people uh, say, oh, it's like influenza, it's like the flu. Influenza doesn't give you this prolonged, uh, you know, exhaustion for months. Uh, and uh, and morbidity of, uh, you know, any organ can be affected by this uh, coronavirus, which is uh, totally new. But also, you know, it makes a big difference whether you've experienced something yourself um, or when you're studying it or fighting it. I mean, I learned that from people living with HIV who are often, um, you know, telling us uh, what works, what doesn't work, um, or women who survive breast cancer. So it's time that we are not only going to communicate about figures and so on, but also people's experience. But also it made me, of course, even more determined to fight the virus. You know, the obvious question is how. I just want to read a little bit because you did write a very affecting um, article about your experience. Partly you said, I've devoted my life to fighting viruses and finally they get their revenge. For a week, I balanced between heaven and earth on the edge of what could have been the end. Um, you know, it, it, it really does sound terribly dramatic. And I just wondered whether you can just ex explain also, I don't know, the psychology, if you, were, if you had any space for that. What was it like being in hospital? We hear about the loneliness, the separation between those who are ill and, and their loved ones, and, and just the, the unique qualities of this particular disease. Yeah, first of all, uh, you're totally exhausted, so there is not much... Uh, how to say space in even in your brain for lots of things your world shrinks and it shrinks like uh, you know thinking of my wife Heidi and my kids and that was about it um, but also I was there with three other men who were suffering from the same problem hardly any communication because we were completely exhausted but it's the isolation we couldn't get out of there we could not receive visitors but I was saying, okay, fortunately, we have technology today. There is the mobile phone and we can even, you know, we can see uh, each other. Um, if this would have happened, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, no cell phones and, uh, and even 10 years ago, very difficult to have, you know, a video communication. So that really helped. But it's the loneliness. And uh, fortunately, mm -hmm. I was not in, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, intensive care where people died just completely uh, on their own, and that's terrible. And quickly, Dr. Pierre, well, not quickly, explain to us, because you also say that you were just dreading the idea of a ventilator being, you know, intubated into you. Luckily, well, fortunately, you needed oxygen and not a ventilator. But you see, this is really interesting because ventilator, ventilator, ventilator has been the mantra since the beginning, but you were afraid that if you actually got it, you might die with a ventilator. Well, yeah, there's no doubt that ventilators, when they're needed, that they can save lives. But, um, you know, what is far more needed uh, is oxygen. Oxygen, that's what most people can, you know, get most people through their, uh, you know, very low oxygen saturation levels. And um, <clears throat> with ventilators, we should be very selective. So, uh, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, low-income countries uh, with the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. We work a lot in Africa and in, 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 in India, and they always say we need ventilators. Well, there's no oxygen. And I think with oxygen, we'll be able to, you know, to save far more lives uh, than with a few ventilators, uh, although both are needed. So we have to put these things in, uh, in perspective. Yeah, so that's really important. And again, let me just repeat that I'm not just asking an eminent epidemiologist about his experience. You are the world's leading virologist, epidemiologist, and you and your school were responsible, along with Imperial College, for, you know, the models that led to a late, but nonetheless, a lockdown here in Britain. You had these models that showed that if there wasn't a lockdown, there were going to be potentially hundreds of thousands of dead here and maybe more than a million in the United States. The lockdowns have prevented that. So I want to ask you, since you are Dr. Peter Piot, what you make of the latest in terms of vaccines. We've heard the president of the United States and now AstraZeneca. We've heard Moderna in the United States. Basically, the human trials are taking place. And I want to know from your perspective, when you think that they will be available, the vaccines. 
Well, when you we, talk, we hear a lot about uh, an exit strategy, you know, and uh, and that's really important. But the only real exit uh, should come from from science, I think, and that's from a vaccine, which will protect us from becoming infected and from becoming from dying. There are about, uh, as far as I know, there are eight uh, candidate vaccines now in in clinical trials in people in so-called phase one, and about maybe 30 that are you know, will soon go into clinical trials. So there's a lot of activity going on. And um, the, this week there, were some, uh, there was some encouraging news um, that um, both the um, Moderna um, vaccine, a candidate vaccine, which is based on injecting the genetic material, the messenger RNA in the body to, so that the body will produce its own vaccine, that they said that uh, in, um, in, in mice, it prevents um, pneumonia, and also that in a small number of people, in eight people, it elicited um, so-called neutralizing antibodies. These are antibodies that neutralize, that mm -hmm. kill off the virus. And that is a um, one of the usual the requirements for a vaccine to work. And then there's a totally different vaccine that was developed by um, Oxford University, as you mentioned, with uh, AstraZeneca now. And, um, and that's also an approach that is being used by a company in China, CanSino, and by Johnson & Johnson. And they have uh, demonstrated in, uh, in macaques, in monkeys, that um, the vaccine protects the monkeys from pneumonia. However, the, the, the monkeys also continue to excrete the virus, um, you know, um, from, their, from their noses. So um, we have to really go... Uh, an, all-out effort to uh, make sure that we can develop a vaccine. And um, there are many things that have to happen there. First of all, you have to demonstrate that it works, that it protects not only young people, but also the most vulnerable in society. In other words, older people. And uh, there's sometimes, um, you know, vaccines are less effective. So they have to demonstrate that. And the only way to find out is to do these large-scale human trials. But secondly, there's also a safety issue. You mentioned that um, a promise of uh, producing a few hundred million vaccines. But the truth is that we need billions, not millions. Um, we need probably five, six billion uh, doses of this vaccine. And that means it has to be absolutely safe. Again, that requires quite some long, long uh, trials. Um, and thirdly, we need to manufacture billions of vaccines. That capacity at the moment is not necessarily there. So we shouldn't wait until we know whether a vaccine works or not. We already have to make sure that that manufacturing capacity is there. Um, and then lastly, we need to make sure once these vaccines are there, and when I talk about billions, uh, we need to make sure it's the nitty gritty, are there uh, billions of small glass files to put these vaccines in? Probably not. So they, we need to produce all that. And then lastly, we need to make sure that uh, everybody who needs it gets this vaccine and that it's not really limited to a, a few countries that produce these vaccines. From your experience, do you think that that will happen, that very important fact? China has said that it must, you know, it would help and support a people's vaccine. In other words, something that's available to everyone. Uh, others have said so. We don't know whether it's going to be available to everyone, regardless of their, you know, ability to pay for it. Well, there is something, a new word now that's coming up, and that's uh, vaccine nationalism, where countries will say, OK, the vaccine that's produced uh, in our country will go to our citizens. And I understand that that's a concern for every government. But uh, vaccine development and manufacturing is a very, very restricted business in the sense that very few companies do it. And um, so most countries in the world do not produce any vaccine. So and they also should have access. That's why some initiatives are really important. Um, for example, on the 1st of May, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the um, European Commission, together with a number of countries, uh, with the Gates Foundation, with the Wellcome Trust, with CEPI, with WHO, uh, announced a, an initiative and raised money for it already up to now to $8 billion to make sure that not only that these vaccines and therapeutics also and diagnostics are being um, developed, 
but also that they would become uh, available for those in need um, in various European countries, because that's her, uh, you know, her domain politically, but also in uh, poorer nations such as in Africa, which all will need to have access to this vaccine. So this is going to become, I think, a big political issue for the future. And where, if, if you're looking now at the future and you see this first wave in many countries is, is being wrangled right now, you see easing of lockdowns in many parts of the world. What do you predict for the next, I don't know, in the fall and then in the winter and where? Where do you predict this virus will go? And what is the key now without a vaccine, without the therapeutic to a safe exit? Yeah, it is uh, predictable that we will see um, several waves of infections with these vaccines. The good news is that now that um, many countries, at least in Asia and in uh, Europe, uh, in some states in the US, that the number of uh, new infections and the number of deaths um, is going down. Um, that allows for a trade-off with, uh, you know, resuming societal and economic activity, and it will always be a trade-off. So that's a, that's a good news. However, um, we need to learn some lessons from uh, the initial responses, um, because they will be very important for dealing with um, new outbreaks that will come. And the first and most important lesson is act early. When you look at Europe, for example, um, a country like Germany was very early on, uh, massively testing, acted very early on, and has, um, you know, low number of infections and particularly low number of deaths. Other countries, including the UK, were a bit late. Um, and um, we'll need to apply the same thing, you know, when we need a massive surveillance, uh, by that I mean massive testing, to know where, uh, you know, in in the fall, in, in, in winter, uh, whenever, uh, that new cases are appearing. And as soon as there is an increase, uh, we need to put in place uh, really serious measures, not necessarily a lockdown. Um, I think uh, if we are massively testing and we know where the epidemic is, uh, a new outbreak is, we can isolate people, we can look for contacts. Um, by that time, we may have some therapeutics that could be given to the contacts of people, so a certain kind of preventive measure, so-called prophylaxis. Um, so that all that will be important. So and then I think here technology is going to be extremely important. Not only testing, because testing is not available enough in many countries, and uh, but that's a matter of logistics of organizing it, but also having an army of uh, contact tracers people who look for all those who have been in touch with the case. But then also technology, the apps that are now being, uh, you know, developed and, and being introduced in many countries that tell you whether you've been close to someone with, um, you know, COVID-19 infection. And uh, so that will be really, really important for early detection and early action. But that early action depends on strong leadership. It's not enough to have the technology and the, and the data if there's no action on it. And people have to be involved right. uh, in, in all this. So that is really the, the new phase that we're going into. But it will be less of a bulldozer approach where, you know, a lockdown of uh, entire societies, but more really uh, targeted. Uh, we still have a big problem in care homes in this country and in many other countries. Um, in many people become infected in the hospital, uh, uh, you know, healthcare workers who then infect people in their community, in their prisons. Um, so we need to concentrate our efforts where the virus is, yep. and uh, and then we can make a difference. But that requires uh, absolutely up-to-date information and lots of testing. Yeah, I hear you very loud and clear. Testing, tracing, surveillance, they must get that up and running. And we hope they will do yeah. that sooner rather than later, obviously. Dr. Peter Piot, thank you so much for joining us. And we're glad that you're on our program for the first time since you're better. So we're very pleased to have you back. Thank you so much. Now, every day we report the numbers of those who've died from this unforgiving virus. And it's important that we do so. But we want to pause now to think about the people behind those numbers. 
More than a quarter of coronavirus deaths here in the UK have been in care homes and in the United States. They account for 20% of the death toll. But behind every statistic is a life cut short and a person who loved and who was loved. Rose Mitchell was 81 years old when she died from COVID-19 in a care home here in London last month. And afterwards, her sister wrote a powerful poem. She said, my sister is not a statistic. And that was to memorialize her life. Dorothy Duffy joins me now from her home here in London. Dorothy Duffy, we're very pleased to have you on our program. You just heard from the greatest virologist around that care homes have been a very difficult place and your sister sadly died there. I just want to know from you personally, what was it like when she was sick? What, were you able to have any contact? What was the, the, the situation for you and for her? My sister was moved from hospital into a care home within a few days of lockdown. And so very quickly um, and not long after she had moved in, we were advised that we couldn't actually see her. So she was blind um, and she was becoming quite forgetful. So trying to help her conceptualize what lockdown was, what COVID-19, it was like something from a science fiction novel for her to understand. So we were unable to see her in person. Her daughter Karen had filled her room with all her familiar clothing, her pictures, even though she couldn't see them. We wrote her emails and letters and the care home staff who were wonderful read them out to her. So we were telling her about what was happening in our daily lives and how much we loved her, etc. But it was heartbreaking and heartrending not to be able to see her and to know that she couldn't fully comprehend why it was she wasn't able to see her children, especially and the, her loved ones and her grandchildren. But we were in contact by phone and we were in contact via letters, which the, the staff read out. And one that her daughter wrote to her, um, the care home manager, Dominic, uh, rang her and said, I've just read your letter to your mum and she's just fallen into a lovely sleep. It was it just reminded me that it was a bit well, like a bedtime story. Yeah, and it's so important because you're talking about the human, you know, the human contact and how so many of the carers were such humanitarians and really did try to do everything they could for people in their care. You've also, though, said, uh, you know, talking about it afterwards and writing your poem, you called the sort of daily, you know, focus on it a sort of like the daily deathometer, the statistics, you know, and you are a family who, you know, humanize those statistics. And you've said your poem to Rose, who was 81, you know, you reference throwaway lines, platitudes, the description of the dead as an older person with underlying health conditions. And I wonder if you could maybe read for us a, a little excerpt of the poem that you wrote for your sister afterwards. Yes, of course. My sister is not a statistic. Tomorrow, when the latest deathometer of COVID is announced in sonorous tones, my sister will be among those numbers. Among the throwaway lines, among the platitudes and lowered eyes, an older person with underlying health conditions. A pitiful way to lay rest the bare bones of a life. My sister is not a statistic. Her underlying conditions were love, kindness, belief in the essential goodness of mankind, uproarious laughter, forgiveness, compassion, a storyteller, a survivor, a comforter, a force of nature, and so much more. My sister is not a statistic. She died without the soft touch of a loved one's hand, without a feathered kiss upon her forehead, without the muted murmur of familiar family voices gathered round her bed, <clears throat> without the gentle roar of laughter that comes with memories recalled, evoked from a time that already seems distant, when we were connected by the simplicity of touch, of voice, of presence. 
It's really beautiful. And of course, I can hear your grief and your sadness in your voice. I just want to know, lastly, what you hope that publicly reading this, having publicly posted it, and it went viral all over the place, it was very well received. What do you want people to know? And has it helped you with your grief? I want people to know that my sister had a full, long, wonderful life and a zest for living. She loved people. She was probably the kindest person I've ever met in my life. And she gave so much to people and she got so much back. So when those daily statistics come out, and I know that the people who have lost loved ones will feel it, that those, they're not statistics, they are loved ones that are now, have left a hole in someone's life, in a family's life, in a loved one's life. And the manner in which they died meant that towards the end, they weren't be able to be with them. And I would just, it has helped me in my grief because I've had so many messages from people who said that it articulated what they felt. And I just hope that when the process for dealing effectively with the ongoing transmission of this virus, that it is done in the memory and with love for all of those who have died, whether or not they had underlying health conditions, they should not be defined by that and they should not be remembered by that. They should be remembered as being loved ones who had a life and were loved. Well, Dorothy Duffy, thank you so much. You have really made that message and sent it loud and clear to all of us. Thank you so much. And of course, with all this grief, the stress and the loneliness ahead on the program, we have a little bit of an antidote, really the incredible medical benefits of connecting with nature. That's ahead. But first, this pandemic has prompted a lot of us to reflect on how the world works and importantly, who it works for. That's at the heart of a new program called Seat at the Table on Vice TV from writer and best-selling author Anand Girdidas. He has made a career of questioning the seat of power and money in America. And now he tells our Hari Srinivasan why society really needs to adapt or fail. Thanks, Christian. Anand, thanks for joining me. Uh... This entire period seems like a strange time to start an entirely new television program, but what has been revelatory for you? What are you talking with your guests about? It's interesting. We, we, we conceived of Seat at the Table and, and set it up right before we realized what was going to happen with the pandemic. So we had a complete, uh, briefly sketched plan for a normal world TV show. And, and the idea in, in that phase was... Uh, thinking about power, uh, thinking about the fact that the central issue in American life, in my view, is the imbalance of power, the concentration of power, power allied with wealth, and that that was often reflected in what you see in a lot of cable news. Um, the, the kind of interests of power, the ideas of power um, reflected more than those of the powerless, and we wondered if we could change that. Then the pandemic struck, so there was a logistical uh, element of that. Suddenly we're all dispersed. Everybody's on, you know, Zoom and figuring out, can you make a TV show when everybody's separate on Zoom? Turns out you actually can, thanks to the remarkable technologies we have in this time. Um, but, but actually the mission didn't have to change at all because um, I think the thesis about power um, was amplified by the pandemic rather than change. You know, I, but we often say the pandemic's unprecedented. It's not unprecedented. It's a building on the mega trends of the last 30 or 40 years, including the growing consolidation of power. And, you know, another thing we say is we're all in it together. Uh, we are not all in it together. We haven't been, and we're not all in it together in the pandemic. And so those have become the, the issues we're digging into even more deeply, trying to understand why the pandemic has unfolded the way it has in America, which is different from South Korea, different from Germany, as you know, different from all kinds of other places. Um, the virus wasn't uh, a product of plutocracy and an oligarchy in America, but the way in which the virus has affected us is very much a product of those social conditions. When you say we're not all in this together, you mean what, that we're all impacted differently? That that's how it's separate for us? In, in many ways. So first of all, just in terms of 
who is dying from this plague. In many parts of this country, it is literally a black plague. Uh, it is a plague that is killing African Americans at substantially higher rates than other communities. And that is for a whole host of reasons, including health access people have, including doctors not listening to people, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we're not all in it together in, in, in terms of who is, who is living and who is dying. Um, but we're also not in it together in terms of everybody else who doesn't have the thing, but is affected by the economic and social upheaval that this is. Um, you know, who gets to be someone who works from home? That is not evenly distributed either. If you look at even racially, the, the fraction of white people who have a job that allows them to continue working from home versus the fraction of blacks and Latinos who can do that, it's just really, really different. Um, and if you look at the, the precarity of employment in the last many years, the increasing precarity, the rise of the gig economy, you know, Uber drivers are, are kind of all of us uh, as, as Silicon Valley has deepened its hold on the economy and you have this notion of people you know, being contracted out to work through apps that actually often steal some of their money and steal their tips. Well, you know, we've now realized that employing millions of people in this precarious way um, results in massive social calamities that are a choice, right? The virus isn't a choice, but to have tens of millions of people with instantly no security, no savings out, you know, out on the street, so to speak, um, is, a, is a product of social choices we have made that other societies, you know, chose more wisely uh, to do differently. When you talk about choice, there's also I mean, one of the segments on your program recently. There, it was called, I think, the War on Government. There's a pretty sizable movement uh, among supporters of the president that seems pro-freedom. It also seems anti-government. We recently had. Uh, the uh, author and professor Tom Nichols on, and he said, you know what, the, that freedom is confused with the type of freedom that children have. But you also went on in your program and talked about how there is a certain tyranny in life with no government at all. Explain that. You know, many Americans have a childlike understanding of freedom, as you say. Um, and what that consists of is an understanding of freedom, which in many ways goes back to our founding um, a freedom obsession, I would say, these, these Americans have, in which freedom is defined as the absence of government. Now, or government doing as little as possible, or government leaving you alone. Now, I would be the first to say that is an element of freedom. There's a whole bunch of things, right, uh, that I don't want the government intervening in my life, and I share that. I think everyone listening to this would share that. But for a great number of Americans with this infantile understanding of freedom, that is it. That is freedom. Freedom is being left alone by government. And it's being paranoid about government being way more interested in you than you are actually interesting, right? It, government's coming for your guns. Government's coming to, you know, regulate your food away. Government's coming to, you know, uh, tell you who, in, who you can meet. Government's coming to manipulate you through, you know, its allies and the fake news. I mean, this kind of paranoid attitude, government coming to get you. And the point we made on the segment was what this has done is obscure the way in which a large aspect of human freedom is actually not threatened by government, but by private actors, right? A bank screwing you over, speculating in ways that lead to you losing your home is also a threat to your freedom. It doesn't mean government's not a threat to your freedom, but the threat can also come from over there, right? A company dumping toxic chemicals into the creek where your kids play is also threatening your freedom and their freedom, but it's not government. And what we have often failed to understand as a culture, and certainly these millions of Americans who feel this way, is that when the threats actually come from private actors, your best bet against those kinds of threats are the government. If you are hungry because you're paid seven bucks an hour instead of 15, the government is your best bet to make sure you get paid 15. There's not, there's not another easy way to make that happen. And so this childlike freedom obsession that tens of millions of Americans unfortunately have is literally killing us in this pandemic because they are so focused on government oppressing them through lockdowns that they don't understand that you can end up way more oppressed by a virus, 
You can end up way more oppressed by uh, not having economic security. You can end up way more oppressed by having the kind of healthcare system that encourages people to stay home instead of get tested. Right now, we are in an unprecedented time of government spending. I mean, we've passed literally trillions of dollars out the door. Has the government stepped up to help with this stimulus package? You know, the stimulus is not only a question of amounts, but about how wisely you disperse the money. So you can have stimulus that is cornered by big business, as, as happened with the Paycheck Protection Program, or you can have stimulus that really goes to regular people. I mean, I've been seeing stories from across Europe where, you know, freelancers just suddenly woke up to money being deposited into their accounts by the government because they recognized that freelancers would need it in this time, right? That's just a, our society could work that way. We just choose to have it not work that way. Um, and then there's this notion of conditionalities. The economist Mariana Mazzucato talks about this. It's, it's the notion that if you're going to be giving companies a lot of money when they're desperate, they're on their knees begging for the government's money, this is an extraordinary time to ask them for a couple things, right? Normally, in the absence of a crisis, these companies have a lot of power and it's, you know, they got these lobbyists and it's hard to get regulatory things done on them. Well, when they're begging, it's a good time to ask for what you want. So you do conditionalities. Conditionalities are, okay, you want this paycheck protection plan. You want this kind of bailout of whatever. Um, we would like you to institute these environmental protections. We would like you to, you know, not spend money in politics. We would like you to pay your workers this much. We would like you to commit to these kinds of retraining programs uh, after the pandemic. People, like, you can ask companies for what you want. That's kind of the whole idea. Because taking the money, they don't, they don't have to do it, right? It's, it's actually your money. So you are giving companies money, which may be a shock if you don't have a lot of money that you are actually giving companies money, but you are. And so if you're giving companies money, like the airlines, it's time to ask some things you want. You know what? I don't like those overhead charges. I don't like the fact that you bust the unions of the flight attendants. I don't like the fact that I can't, you know, change my, change my ticket when I have a, you know, problem in my family without spending $500. And you just say to the airlines, you want this bailout money? Here's what we want. The people who are giving you this money. Um, it's a very basic concept that should be understandable to anyone who's ever watched a mafia movie. But somehow this idea of conditionalities hasn't really dawned on the United States Congress. Uh, and it's, it's very, very important that it does in any future relief. This is also an era where we're seeing largesse by billionaires. And you've written about this extensively for your book, Winners Take All. Uh, when you look out at press releases, proclamations, initiatives, funded by billionaires, what goes through your mind? You know, the, the, the virus, again, has only amplified what we've been seeing for the last many years, which is some of the richest and most powerful people, uh, you know, stepping up with these pledges of, of lavish help. But I think one of the things that I found missing from a lot of this conversation that I've been trying to, to articulate is that this very billionaire class that is stepping up to help in the pandemic is in many ways responsible for why the pandemic has unfolded in the way it has in America. Explain that. So if you look at why government has been discredited, intellectually discredited, defunded, defanged from a regulatory point of view, why we shut down pandemic prevention offices, for example, who does that? Working people? Is there is working people advocating for dismantling government? It is very much a product of corporate interest, lobbying in Washington, sometimes succeeding under Democratic administrations, more often succeeding under Republican administrations, to yank out regulation, cut funding, cut taxes so the government can do less, right? The way the pandemic has unfolded in America is inseparable from that discrediting, defanging, and defunding of government. And so, when I see the very same class of people stepping up, I see arsonists returning to the scene of a fire and putting on a costume and claiming to be firefighters. In many ways, what they are doing 
is trying to buy mercy on the cheap. So we don't actually fix this society in a way that reduces their power and makes us not so vulnerable the next time a pandemic like this or something else rolls around. I can hear a CEO or uh, someone who's justifying the market saying they're just responding to shareholders. They are acting in their rational self-interest as stewards of specific companies that we don't necessarily have a system right now that rewards excess capacity in hospitals or having extra masks on hand. How do you change that? Many ways. But first of all, if we, you, you are right about one thing very important here, which is if we want companies that take care of the commons, um, we should change corporate law to require stakeholder capitalism, right? The Business Roundtable, big lobbying group of the biggest companies last year, you know, claimed to do a big deal statement where they she said the purpose of business is no longer just to make money for shareholders, but to, to account for all stakeholders. Unfortunately, you know, I, I confronted Jamie Dimon about this when he reached out to me to, to address my skepticism of this. And I said, you know, Jamie, why don't you, like there are lo pol legislative policies, proposals out there to take the statement and make it the law. Elizabeth Warren had one where it'd be the law of the land for companies of a certain size to take stakeholders. Said, Jamie, this is perfect for you. You said you want this in a statement. You got Elizabeth Warren who wants to take your statement and, and you know, do the ultimate retweet of it, which is put it into the law. Oh, no, 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 that, no, no, no. We don't want to, you know, we wouldn't want to be a police force. These people are not serious. Jamie Dimon is not serious. There's not a seriousness around actually having this be how capitalism works. So they want the moral glow of voluntary virtue, but they don't actually want it to be a rule that companies have to, you know, uh, can't hurt workers, hurt communities, hurt the planet in order to make money. So if you really want companies behaving that way, you got to change the law. Number two, there's a bunch of smaller regulations along the way that are not as big as just the underlying corporate law that actually um, help people make those decisions in better ways. You know, if, you, if you're paying people 15 or 20 bucks an hour um, as, as your minimum, um, you know, you're just not going to have as many billionaires having as many billions, right? Uh, you're not going to have the kind of uh, outsized leverage that big companies have if you know you have way more working people with way more disposable income contributing to political campaigns as they have been in recent years. We have in every phase of American life designed a system that is almost uh, you know bespoke tailored to serve rich people's interests and the wake up call is it doesn't have to be like this. So many other countries are not like this and they still have capitalism. This is what's so shocking to Americans. Do you know that Germany has capitalism? Do you know that all the Scandinavian companies have capitalism? Countries have capitalism. They have great companies there, right? Do you know that those countries with universal health care, you talk to business people there, they love having universal health care. You know why? Because they don't have to pay for it. Their companies, they don't have to actually think about it. When they're starting a small business, they don't have to have this huge expense of paying for people, right? When they're trying to recruit people to their small businesses, they don't have to deal with this problem of people not wanting to leave a big company because they're going to lose their health care. It is actually better to live in a decent society. And when Americans start to wake up to that in greater numbers, it's going to be a great day. The new show is called Seat at the Table on Vice TV. Anand Girdhardas, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I'm keeping them honest there, that show is going to be must-watch television. Now, and finally, during this pandemic, many of us are struggling, of course, in such uncertain times. Looking after our mental health is, of course, more important than ever now. Studies show that connecting with nature can lift our spirits and much more, something our next, next guests know all about. Sue Stewart-Smith is a psychiatrist and she's an author. She's just written The Well-Gardened Mind, which will be released in the United States July 7th. It's already out here in the UK. And also joining us, Ron Finley, a.k.a. The Gangster Gardener. His TED Talk has been watched by millions. He's inspired dozens of community gardens around Los Angeles where he lives, and he's also given a masterclass, and they both join me now. Um, let me start with you, Sue Stewart-Smith, The Well-Gardened Mind. It, it, it's an amazing book to come out right now when everybody is either 
baking bread or trying as much as they can yeah. to connect in some way with nature. Not everybody has that yeah. opportunity. So I just want to ask you some of the real sort of touchstones and, and analysis and, and science that you've found writing this book yeah. about what it can do to people's mental health. Well, it's, it's no surprise, really, that people have been turning to nature in such a big way in response to this crisis. And if we look at history, um, it's, it's, it's a recurring theme, you know, uh, during wars, following wars, following natural disasters. We need to turn back to the land and nature's powers of restoration and natural beauty is very sustaining to us. So, so it, it's something that's happened before many, many times over. Um, and as you mentioned, the pandemic has opened up the divide, the, the social economic divide between those who have gardens and those who don't, because for people who have them, they've been able to appreciate their gardens more than ever before. Um, and I hope that in some measure that might lead to an understanding of how restorative uh, gardens can be for mental health and um, you know, lead to um, things like horticultural therapy being taken a bit more seriously. Yeah, well, let, let me just ask Ron, because I want to get back to the psychology and the statistics with you in a second, yeah. Sue, but I want to ask Ron, uh, who's joining us now from Los Angeles. Um, Ron, you call yourself the gangster gardener, and it's, uh, you know, you've done something in LA that probably probably nobody did. You have turned verges of highways and various land into thriving gardens. Why did you decide to do this? What sort of led you to that place? Real simple, beauty in, beauty out, and how, how are you? Um, because people think health is just what you put into your mouth, and it's not. Health is your environment. Health is what you see every day. Health is, can you smell beauty? Can you look at beauty every day? So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to beautify my community. And no, it wasn't just beauty, though, was it? Because, I mean, I, I think, you know, you talk about, many people talk about a food desert in L.A., but you talk a little bit about, you know, a, a, a food prison, and you're trying to get people to also understand about, as you say, beauty in, beauty out, but what the quality of what you put into your body. Well, it, it, it all goes together. It's just like, you know, most people don't know the single most important thing to your life. They will tell you their family, their daughter, the single most important thing to your life is air, oxygen. But nobody seems to know that because we don't value it. So what I'm, what it's, you, it's not a, it's a shotgun blast. It's not a single bullet. You have to affect air, a lot of things at the same time. And yes, the health disparities are in my communities, uh, in, in black, brown, red, communities across the planet are a lot of times worse than they are in um, other communities <laughs> with other persuasions, and that's by design. So I'm a designer, so I'm trying to change the design. Y you shouldn't have to be well healed to eat healthy food, and that, that, that's why I started mm -hmm. this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the liquor stores are by design. The yeah. fast food yeah. places are by design. Why aren't they in these other affluent mm -hmm. communities like that? You know, and, and it's constantly uh, making us sick. Uh, talking about sick, Sue, you are a psychiatrist, and you, for yes. part for your book and, and basically your research over the years, you went to Rikers Island Prison in New York, where there, I think there's something like 8,000 inmates there. What did you discover about those who could garden and those who couldn't? Just what did you discover about some of the key stats that everybody worries about about prisoners, you know, when they're released, reoffending rates and, and, and the like? Well, the, the, um, the program in Rikers Island is run by the HORT, the Horticultural Society of New York. And the, what their program shows is that uh, the, the prisoners who complete their program and who go on and to the community program called the Green Team have a much lower level of reoffending. The usual rate of reoffending is about 60%. And uh, for the for the green team uh, participants, it's as low as 10 to 15 percent, which is a remarkable difference. Um, some other prison prison projects have, have similar findings as well. And I think I think key to it all is actually this very accessible form of creativity and 
uh, and an empowering and self-esteeming effect that comes from being able to make something good happen, you know, to grow pumpkins or to grow tom tasty tomatoes or beauty, as Ron's mm -hmm. saying. You know, the, 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 there are lots of beautiful flowers in the, in the eight gardens on Rikers. It's not all about produce. Um, and that's mm -hmm. extremely important, I think, just in terms of allowing someone to feel that they might be able to make a change or make a difference in, to their life. And it does, in fact, the, the beauty and some of this uh, basically affects neural pathways, right? I mean, there's a scientific correlation between this yes, and mental is. health. Yes, yes, yeah. No, there is. And I think it's very easy to underestimate how, as Ron's saying about simple things, how crucial they are to our, to our, to our, our neurological fun functioning as well as our psychology. So, for instance, beauty is very interesting, and um, there's a neuroscientist called Semiazeki who has conducted brain scans, and these showed, regardless of the form of beauty, that uh, the pathways being fired in the brain are the same as those in, in romantic love. And that means that beauty mm -hmm. stimulates neurotransmitters like endorphins, our natural opioids, serotonin, dopamine, it stimulates our reward pathways. And these are all motivating and invigorating and, and, and calming, actually, too. I mean, that's the remarkable thing about mm. gardening is it has this combined mm. effect of being both calming but vitalizing as well. Ron, uh, I, 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 there's an incredible statistic. You know, it says basically Americans on average spend 93% of their time indoors or in a vehicle. And I just wondered what you've noticed, whether you've noticed, you know, how kids react. And are you trying to kind of get them at a young age and, and teach them about nature and gardening uh, in, in your community? How's that going? If kids grow kale, kids eat kale. <laughs> you know, it's period. If you expose <laughs> them to this, that's what's going to happen. I'm trying to teach them that they are nature, that nature is not something you go to the forest to see. When you look in the mirror, you look at nature. We decompose just like a leaf does. We decompose just like Bambi does in the forest. We are the forest. We're carbon. And that's the lessons that we should know. What changed me, what changed my thinking was making compost. This is supposed to be dead stuff. So how is it 150 degrees? How did that happen? You know, we're energy. So if we were taught what we truly are, um, I think it would change a whole lot of how we look at this planet. Everything yeah. on this planet is alive, including the mountains, everything, this, this planet. Just, and when we try to put everything in a box, and you can't do that, because um, if you're in a box, the, just like a plant, you put it in a box and the roots don't have anywhere to go. So what are they going to do? They're going to suffocate and choke that plant, and it's not going to get the growth that it needs to. Um, we have to, uh, we, it, it's a duty to teach these kids that, that, that they have a responsibility to nature because if you take care of your mother, you take care of yourself. And you had an extraordinary situation. Well, first of all, I, I think I read that you've barely had to leave your own garden during the lockdown because you've, you've pretty much grown everything you've eaten um, over the last couple of months. But you also have a remarkable story about when you first tried to do this, I think the, the authorities came and tried to uproot your gardens. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was a, I became a criminal because I planted tomatoes. Could you imagine me being in jail and guys asking, yo, homie, what you in for? Yeah, man, I planted some tomatoes on the street, dude, so back off. You know, it's like it was the dumbest thing that you could imagine. And fortunately, I was able to get that law reversed. And so now in the whole city of Los Angeles, you can plant veg edibles on your parkway. My thing is they need to advocate for it. They need to tell people that, and they need to have a team to show people how to do that. We should, no one should have to fight for food. No one should, there's no reason that we should have a skid row with, with all the money and all the resources that we have. And that's why, that's why I say it's all by design. And we can, we're designers. We can change these designs and make these, these communities where they're healthy for everybody, everybody, you know, all the kids. So we do, we have to get and, and to the in, kids. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we understand that kids also, when they go to these forest schools, they get to kind of learn and discover on their own outdoors, find solutions. But finally to you, 
Uh, Sue, you've written in The Well Garden Mind, in this era of virtual worlds and fake facts, mm -hmm. the garden brings mm -hmm. us back to reality. It's exactly the kind of realities that Ron is talking about. You know, we, we have to engage with the natural life cycle. We, we form a relationship, a very close relationship. Gardening is an intimate um, relationship. And um, so we, 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 we engage in that in a way that becomes uh, about give and take, actually. I think it's that recognition of um, how we need to care for the planet, to care for ourselves at that basic level. Indeed, and boy, if we haven't had a signal now, yeah, to care for the planet, um, this yeah. is it. Sue and Ron, thank you yeah. so much for joining us. That, that's wonderful. And that's it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS, and join us again tomorrow night.